Good morning, everyone. So while I wait for the slides to go up, um, thank you very much, uh, Surya, for having me here. I think this course has uh, been going on for very many years. And uh, we've had a lot of speakers who've been uh, imparting with great pearls of knowledge in various aspects of neuroophthalmology and oculoplastics. And I'm also very excited that the chair of the course, the chief instructor, told me that I have loads of time, which you're never told. So uh, I'm going to talk to you about red flags in uh, cellulitis. And uh, the objectives are my, of my presentation are to actually take you through you know, certain aspects of bacterial, fungal, the differentiating features between the two from what I have learned. And then when, how, and what do you do in cases where you can't figure head or tail of what is happening. So let's go through certain aspects of bacterial cellulitis first. So you can see an image of typical cellulitis here. You're seeing all the rubor, pallor, dolor, all of that. And you're seeing uh, imaging which shows you abscesses probably. So there's no second thought of this, right? Looks very much like cellulitis. In certain situations, you see an image like this where you're thrown off as to what this exactly looks like. And these are the atypical cellulitis pictures where a lot of things come handy, such as microbiology, imaging, histopathology. This actually was a hydatid cyst patient. So what I have learned over the past few years is that children typically tend to have a single organism, bacterial cellulitis, aerobic largely. Strep used to be the most common, but now staff is taking over. Versus adults, as they grow up, you tend to get more polymicrobial, therefore your antibiotics have to be targeted. You tend to see more anaerobic organisms. And vision loss in orbital cellulitis is real. About 11% of patients do have vision loss in the pure bacterial version of orbital cellulitis. So I'm just going to run you through a series of cases that I have encountered in my practice. And this, again, is a very typical cellulitis. But what you should be able to pick up from the picture is this localization here. And this being a child, it has to start with your history where you ask the parents, did the child have a watery eye since birth? Because this is a CNLDO which is producing orbital cellulitis in a child. So it's not true that you always need to have an immunocompromised patient for them to develop orbital cellulitis. This is a child who's perfectly immunocompetent, but has thrown up a cellulitis from congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction. All these abscesses had to be drained, and the child eventually did well. Again, very typical cellulitis here, nothing atypical about this, but just one pearl. When you're imaging and you see this in the setting of cellulitis, it is a gas-producing organism. So the imaging is shouting out at you, as to what antibiotic therapy you should be starting for this patient. Quite often, I have fellows come up to me saying there's a foreign body there, and that is what is producing cellulitis. But this is not foreign body. This is gas-producing organism, which has led to cellulitis. So uh, certain atypical cases that I've had uh, the opportunity to treat. Now, you see this gentleman who's come to you with just a two-day history of very severe pain and this kind of a presentation. And what you see over here on the imaging, you're obviously imaging because it's an orbital disease. You are seeing the guitarpic sign or the tenting of the globe, which all of us saw so much in muca times. Absolutely clear sinuses, hardly any sinusitis over there. And you're thinking, is this bacterial? Is this fungal? What is going on? So in this kind of a situation, I would not hesitate in going and getting some sample from the areas that look most infected for us, it was the lacrimal sac region over here. And we got the microbiology workup. We treated him. And lo and behold, you see that he actually has a lacrimal sac uh, infection, a mucosal residual at the end of it. So this was just acute dacryocystitis, so florid in presentation that it actually went in and produced tenting of the eyeball, which means the patient developed a compartment syndrome, which is not something you see very, very commonly in bacterial cellulitis. The one part here that helped us was on micro, we ruled out a fungal infection. And therefore, we bombarded this patient with steroids. And he had a complete recovery in his vision. He presented to us with counting fingers vision because of the tenting. But over the follow-up period, uh, antibiotics, 48 hours, steroids, he came back to 2020 at the end of the treatment. 
So that's something that helps you. Always, wherever you can use microbiology and histopathology, you should go ahead and do it. And this is him after the DCR. Now, this was intriguing. This was a suspected bacterial uh, cellulitis. The patient was diabetic. We treated him with antibiotics, but this is what we saw at the end of treatment. So we followed the same protocol, antibiotics, 48 hours, steroids. And this is him after about 10 days. And we couldn't figure out why the chemosis wasn't disappearing. So we repeated imaging. And what do you see over here? Well, not foreign body. So you see that he has SOV. But what in the SOV? It is dilated, but there's a thrombus sitting in the SOV. This is a post-contrast scan. Right? You see the blood vessels highlighting here. But within the SOV, there is thrombosis. And this is what we were taught in school days, the classic Furkov triad, where you have stasis leading to thrombosis, infection leading to thrombosis. This patient had to be put on aspirin for the thrombosis to resolve. So this was an SOV thrombosis that occurred as a result of orbital cellulitis. And following treatment with is, uh, aspirin as well as long-term steroids, you can see that the inflammation in the orbit has completely resolved. And this is his uh, image. This is the SOV after uh, the treatment period where you can see that the thrombus has now completely resolved. So on the same lines, again, thinking orbital cellulitis, right? Clinical picture, very much like orbital cellulitis. And the fellows were very, very, uh, you know, uh, hesitant about starting um, IV treatment. And I asked them, why is it? And they said, we can palpate something there. There's something wrong here. And we did an imaging, and this is what we saw on the imaging. So what are you thinking? Sinoorbital could still be fungal, right? Could still be cellulitis. But whenever you see this kind of a picture, it's always important to get a histopathology and microbiology like we discussed. This patient had a CA maxilla. So even though he presented with signs which look exactly like orbital cellulitis, it was a mass, and this is him after chemotherapy partial resolution, he's awaiting further surgery for complete treatment of the CA maxilla. Now, one more similar looking patient, just that there's no inflammation, but it's sinoorbital. So what are we thinking? Probably mass, probably fungal. That's what we were thinking. We know that biopsy helps. We went in and biopsied, and this only turned out to be E. coli. Micro grew only E. coli. There was no mass. There was just suppuration on histopathology. This lady had an endogenous E. coli infection from a long-term UTI that she had. Even though the eye was completely quiet and it actually looked like a mass, but it was an infection. And she's had only 10 days of augmentin. And that's how she looks at the end of treatment with aug augmentin. So what I'm trying to say is things can be very, very confusing when you're looking at orbital cellulitis. But it would be nice to go that extra step and to get tissue for histopathology as well as for microbiology smears and cultures and then get your diagnosis. One such another case, to me this was out and out a mass lesion. I was thinking on lines of malignancy. You see these areas over here everywhere that I have highlighted, but I couldn't figure out why the eye looked like this, why the eye was inflamed. There was panophthalmitis inside on the B scans. There were vitreous echoes everywhere, so I couldn't really figure out what it was. Again, resorting to biopsy. This is the imaging, by the way. So you see florid involvement all around. It's preceptal, it's orbital. And look at the bone. The bone there has this eaten appearance. This was actinomycosis. And you see the sunburst appearance of the, these bacilli on histopathology. So we had to stain the histopathology slides and show it to the microbiologist to tell us what exactly this is. And that's the kind of intervention you may need in cases that turn out to be confusing. We eventually lo lost that patient. So for the bacterial spectrum, we know that you have an acute onset in bacterial cellulitis. You have general symptoms, fever, malaise, all of that. You have uh, your CBC to rely on. You have a red sign, red eye signs of infection. And you can largely localize it to the sinuses. And Augmentin works wonders. You always give a follow-up of steroids after 48 hours. Microbiology usually helps you in 45% of the cases. But I showed you that there are certain other things that you need to pay attention to, especially NLDOs, congenital or acquired, SOV thrombosis that might occur in the setting of cellulitis, 
and sometimes you may have infection with anaerobes where you should suspect an endogenous cause and you may need to add up with um, uh, antibiotics with, uh, which are specifically targeted to anaerobes such as the carbapenems. Now briefly talking about the fungal spectrum. So two organisms that largely are there in our kitty, mucorails and aspergillus. We saw a lot of muca during the COVID time, but aspergillus is just as common. Mucorails more in diabetics and aspergillus more in HIV patients or other causes of immunodeficiencies. And we all know the typical spectrum with which fungal disease presents. We know that there's also bone involvement, bone destruction, and it's largely cyanohorbital. And again, histopath and micro comes to rescue. So this is one such gentleman mucomycosis. Look at the subtle restriction of abduction in the right eye. So he was post COVID and this is a scan which is shouting out loud that it is mucomycosis, sinuses are debrided, you don't see any turbinates there. He's already had that and the orbit is involved. And in a matter of a day, he went on from that subtle uh, restriction of abduction to total uh, ophthalmoplegia over here. This is what fungus can do. It can be a quiet eye but shows very quick progression and sinuses are usually haze, uh, hazy. We did not exenterate him. We removed just the necrotic areas in the MRI and this is his follow-up. He regained from counting fingers back to 2020, not exenterated, living today, following up for over two and a half years. So that's the kind of targeted treatment that sometimes you need for muca. Now this one picture, Akshay can uh, kind of relate to this, is again mucor, but look at the sinuses. So it doesn't mean that mucor has to enter the eye only through the sinuses. There are several other routes via which it can enter, largely the pterygopalatine fossas that you should be looking for on imaging. Now, a few atypical cases that I've had the fortune, if I may say, to see uh, or examine or treat. This is a lady who came with this kind of nodule. I couldn't figure out what is going. Imaging showed this sclerosis of bone. Not much destruction, but thickening. And I've come to learn over time that this is what happens in a lot of fungal diseases. This turned out to be aspergillosis. We biopsied not only the nodule, but also the bone, both of which showed aspergillosis. We treated her with long-term um, antifungals. Her clinical situation does, did not change much, but she has been uh, kind of in clinical remission. Now, if we had an oncology session just before this, you see the scan, what do you think? Lacrimal gland and something at the apex. This is shouting out adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? Perineural spread. But if you look closely, this is what has happened to the bone. The bone is destructed over here. So again, biopsied turned out to be fungus, but there was already a telltale sign. You see this kind of a fistula, you should be thinking it's a fungal disease. So this again turned out to be a fungal infection and has been on treatment. This is his post-treatment scan where you can see some resolution in the lacrimal gland as well as the apical portion of uh, the lesion. And typically in fungal diseases, radiologically you can say resolving when you start seeing new bone formation like this. So the destructed margins of the bone tend to get better over a period of time. This was thoroughly confusing for me, single muscle enlargement. Um, everything under the roof was on my differential diagnosis. Initially thought it's just myositis, let's treat with steroids. But something just put me off and I said, okay, wait, let's biopsy coarse edges somewhere on the muscle and turned out to be fungal disease. And we had to treat her with aspergillosis. One more lady, my fellows were shouting thyroid eye disease over here, retraction and all of that. I said, no, wait, something just looks off. Biopsy turned out to be fungal. But before biopsying, did a CT scan. And what did the CT scan show? Destruction in the bone over here and a lesion which is actually sinoorbital. So don't get, uh, you know, misguided by certain scan pictures. And she's been on antifungals and that's how she's resolved. Just the last case, everything that looks cellulitis is not always cellulitis. This to me looked very much like cellulitis. This is a HIV positive patient, but on biopsy turned out to be a high grade lymphoma. Uh, we eventually lost this patient. She had multiple metastases all over. This is her after the biopsy. And about a month into the treatment, uh, we lost the patient. So to summarize, fungal infections can masquerade as anything under the roof. Typically, you'd see it in an immunocompromised patient. It has a subacute presentation. Ophthalmoplegias are very common. If you see cutaneous fistulas, bone destruction, or hyperostosis of the bone, still suspect fungal micro and path really comes in handy in these situations. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Tarjini. Questions, comments? OK, uh, that was a lovely presentation, Tarjini. So this is Thanks. an open question both to you and to the audience. I anecdotally know of two patients from other people where the patient underwent drainage of an abscess, which was fairly superficial, preceptal eyelid and one lacrimal abscess. So these are obviously patients who have not been prognosticated for loss of vision and so on. The next day, the patient is no peer. OK, has anybody else come across this? So I would presume this has to be a toxin because there was no spread of the infection deep into the orbit. Has anybody else come across such a situation? And if so, what could have been done about it? So one case I can remember is about a mucor that I treated in the COVID season where only one eye looked involved and it was extensive involvement and a plan was made to exenterate that eye. That eye was exenterated and next day the patient was no PL in the other eye. And that was not a surgical complication. There was no ophthalmic artery tone or embolism or something like that. It's just that we missed subtle mucor on the other side and that became perineural on the other side and we lost vision. Yeah, the, these were both staff. Mm. Staph aureus. Even, even I had a similar case, aged lady, uh, not a known diabetic or hypertensive, clear cut orbital collection. I generally do aspiration with uh, 18 gauge rather than actually draining because it works well. Uh, and she actually improved because on table proptosis was less, so she became better. But she lost her vision, not like exactly no PL, but it became like significantly low. And uh, yeah, eventually she recovered from the infection, but she lost her vision. And the uh, abscess was nowhere near the optic nerve. Uh, so that like while aspirating or compression or something, but I have seen one patient. Yes. I don't know if it's the sudden decompression. While you aspirate, so, that could have an so effect. Superficial. Yeah. So, may, maybe an embolus. Possible. Just tough luck, maybe. Compliments to the speakers and spectrum of cases. I think uh, just as how intravitreal in infections are now being considered for almost immediate or early post antibiotic steroids. Inflammation has a significant role in the pathogenesis of orbital disorders and vascular infiltrative disorders. So any form of manipulation is drainage, aspiration, whatever it is, or the natural history alone of the disease is enough to actually predispose towards those kind of optic neuritis related visual loss rather than a vascular visual loss. So to be kept in mind. Uh, the question I had for you, Tarjani and all of Indian experts is that COVID really brought out the worst of poor health of our South Asian patients and also contamination, God knows whatever it is. Question for you is all the fungal cases that you've seen, how many of them had received steroids by a general practitioner, a primary ophthalmologist in some form or the other, which has been causing the festering of the fungal infection for you to manage radically? Thank you. A lot of patients of mucomycosis that I saw in my practice had received steroids, a lot of patients, systemic steroids, largely because these were uh, post-COVID and that was considered as a mainstay of treatment for COVID in our part of the world, um, remdesivir shortage or whatever you might say. So uh, yes, a lot of them had received fungal. But I want to talk about the opposite spectrum if there's two minutes. So there, there are a couple of cases of fungal granulomas right? No COVID, nothing, just pure simple fungal granulomas that you tend to see, which tend to remain indolent. And like you spoke about uh, steroids in endophthalmitis, do you feel there is a role of a tiny depot of injection of steroid even in those kind of fungal cases? Because they just stay there. They don't disappear either clinically or on radiologically. You do serum markers, you do galacto manin assays. They are in the normal range, which tells you that systemically the fungus is not really florid. So do you inject a depot of steroid there? Well, refractory ones, but to me, non-steroidals are the usual part of treatment of any infection, curbing the early stage of inflammation. After about 24, 48 hours, when the smoldering inflammation, to me, I have a low threshold for steroids. 
usually have to get it cleared by the IT guys and usually they're ambivalent. Never agree. Absolutely. Uh, the reason I brought this up concept of steroids is because in the 1950s and 60s, there was a spate of fungal corneal infections around the world. And people are wondering what happened in the 1950s and 60s. Just in the 40s and 50s, topical steroids was in the market. Right. So the use of steroids by unsupervised agents or whatever it is, is what I think is causing a lot of these fungal infections. I thought I should bring that to everybody's attention. Thank you so much. Uh, one, uh, that case about uh, acnomycetes, so uh, how the, did the pathologist suspect uh, acnomycetes? Or? Nobody suspected when the sample went. They said there's this one collection of bacteria here. We don't know what it is. Obviously, the pathologists are not as great as the microbiologists. So then, and we work as a team. Mm -hmm. So we had the microbiologists stain the pathology slides and then tell us, what do you think this looks like to you? And they were like, oh, this is the sunburst appearance you see in actinomycosis. And they see a lot of it from canaliculitis. So to choose the stain, you would have to choose a... Uh, so that's the micro invading no, their turf, which how, I don't how, want. How the thought process to actually think about... Actinomycosis. Because they did see the bacilli, right? You're able to see the bacilli on your HNE. And based on that, they said definitely infection, what we don't know. But yeah, the, the, there's a difficulty in the culture. Right. But was it nocardia or was it, what, what, what did they? It was not nocardia, it was actinomyces. Because that uh, CT scan coronal that you showed, Bold and uh, we'd seen it uh, some time ago, and that was, that was typical. It was that, and then when we looked at the literature, we found that that kind of a moth-eating appearance is supposed to be very specific. And I think the difference between whether it is actinomyces or nocardia is whether because nocardia tend to be uh, more deeper in the orbit. So, and then you might have small micro abscesses which come on the skin and they come in crops and go away. Mm. But they, a lot of uh, bone changes that tends to always make you feel that there's a malignancy or something. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Uh,